three episodes. Well, as promised, we'll be doing the draw and the giveaway at the end of the review. What is tonight's review? Well, only the most bloodiest, brutal battle between two evil psychopaths since last year's election. The 2003 crossover event. Freddy versus Jason. This was a battle over a decade in the making. Both Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th were in their commercial prime in the mid to late 80s. And when the Friday the 13th riots were bought out by New Line, they teased the living hell out of the idea. Most people remember the confirmation teaser at the end of Jason Goes to Hell the Final Friday. There was also this scene from Friday the 13th Part 6 that may or may not have been a teaser as well. There was this monster, and he was after me, and he wanted to kill me. Where? He was everywhere. Oh, you mean you had a bad dream. Okay, listen, sweetie. What's your name? Nancy. Although, to be honest, she looks less like Nancy, and more like she should be placing her hands against the TV screen and going, They're here. So, this movie starts with Freddy providing a rehasher on his origins and the Nightmare franchise as a whole. But after they killed me, I became something much, much worse. The stuff nightmares are made of. The children still feared me, and their fear gave me the power to invade their dreams. <laughs> You see that? Your continuity about Freddy getting his powers from little sperm ghosts is being completely ignored! <coughs> Freddy also exposits that he's been MIA for four years now, due to the citizens of Elm Street having forgotten about him, and thus there being no fear left for him to feed on. His solution? He may get the blood, but I'll get the glory. And that fear... Here's my ticket home. Mike? Is that you? <laughs> Jason, kill for me. Hold on, Freddy, I seem to have a shirtless girl in my eye. Jesus Christ. So here we are at Camp Crystal Lake, and this has got to be like, what, nearly 50 years after Friday the 13th started? Bitch, well over a hundred people have been killed in this very location. What exactly about this site of mass murder screamed sex spot to you? Come on, it's not funny anymore. Unsurprisingly, Jason shows up to exterminate all cliches. But he's not quite fast enough, because we then run into the biggest one of them all. Falling over and deciding to stop running as a result. Run, bitch! Run! After Jason jackhammers the girl into a tree trunk, it's his turn to be surprised, as her corpse suddenly begins speaking to him, followed by the appearance of his mother. Do you know what your gift is? No matter what they do to you, you cannot die. You can never die. New Line won't let you. Wait, he's owned by Warner Brothers now. Mrs. Voorhees sends Jason on a mission to Elm Street to begin a new killing spree. But in actuality, it's Freddy in disguise, who plans to use Jason to stir up fear in Springwood and allow him to return. After the movie's self-mutilation, Jason arrives at Elm Street. So, what, did he walk the whole way? All 550 miles from New Jersey to Ohio? At that walking speed? How can he take so long? Because that's what he does. So, obviously the best place to start a Freddy fear resurgence would be the old Thompson residence, 1428. Currently occupied by our heroine for this movie, Laurie, and her friends, Ginger from Ginger Snaps, and one of the I'm not Beyonce so I don't matter Destiny Childs. Destiny's child? Destiny children? What's the plural for that? Jason gets right to work on building on a body count, stabbing Ginger's boyfriend Token Jock a few hundred times in the spine before turning him into a bed sandwich. After the police arrive, it seems Freddy's plan is working and people are starting to whisper his name again. It's gotta be him, right? It's gotta be Freddy Krueger. Hey, don't 
Don't even say that son of a bitch's name out loud. And despite the fact that the adults are aware of Freddy being a dream demon, it somehow hasn't turned them into an entire town of battling nincompoops. And the effects seem to work fast too. As at the police station, Laurie falls asleep and begins dreaming. And there is no doubt, the ambience here in the dream sequences is pretty spooky. But Freddy doesn't manage to get in much more than a boo before Laurie wakes up. Same with the dude meister here. It seems that while he can get into their dreams again, he can't actually kill them yet. So better step up your game, Jason. Do you know how long it took for me to stick that head back on there? Ooh, we're at the nut house now. We can recruit Lawrence Fishburne in on this shit and bust some skulls. Hypnosil. What does this shit do, anyway? How can we all have to take it? I'll soon reveal that I've been here for four years, and that is the first time I've ever asked that question. By the way, Springwood, for a town that's tried so hard to forget about Freddy, your news network's name is dangerously close to his. Might want to address that. So the real reason we're here in the Cuckoo's Nest is to be introduced to Laurie's ex, Will, and his friend, former Freddy victim, Mark. And yes, Will is played by Jason Ritter, the son of John Ritter, who you may remember from Bride of Chucky, which was also directed by Ronnie Yu. Oh god, hope Freddy and Jason don't have a weird sex scene in this movie. After seeing the news report about the murder, Will wants to escape the hospital and get back to Springwood to see if Laurie's alright. Look around you, man. We're institutionalized. We're stuck here. We're not going anywhere. Three minutes later. Well, that was strangely easy. The next morning, Laurie and the girls all meet up at school. Oh, what's this? Jay and Silent Bob handing out party invites for a big rave in the middle of nowhere tonight? I shall only attend if you can promise me there'll be plenty of ladies, alcohol, and bloody carnage. Laurie isn't too keen on going on the party, because she's too busy having a nervous breakdown describing her Freddy nightmares to the other girls. No, 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 there's always these little girls. It's and okay, they, they were singing, dream. they were singing like this, this song like... One, two, Freddy's coming for you. Seamless entrance. Mark! That's enough. Not as good as mine. The four years later reunion with Will was a bit too much for the sleep deprived Laurie, who faints in the hall and is taken to the nurse's office. But seeing as Freddy's name was dropped, his power is slowly beginning to increase. <laughs> Got your nose! Will and Mark, meanwhile, have ditched the school and are at the local library, with Mark looking for information on Freddy, to which he discovers it's all been erased. It seems it was all the plan of the citizens, institutionalize all of Freddy's surviving victims to quarantine them for the rest of the town to make sure that the memory dies out. So just as long as nobody mentions Freddy in front of all oh, the entire student body of Springwood High, for instance, we'll all be fine and he won't return. Yeah, well, you sure as hell spread enough fear today at school. Holy shit. Uh-oh, spaghetti -os. Unsurprisingly, the combination of Mark's spill at school and Jason's killing spree have made the name of Freddy spread like wildfire amongst the teens at that night's rave party, where we realise it's been well over 20 minutes now since we last saw either Freddy or Jason. <laughs> oh, here we go. So it appears Ginger is dreaming now as her dead boyfriend appears to her and leads her into the infamous boiler room where Freddy seals her in. Oh no! How dare they redo a popular scene from the original with modern day effects! 
BURN THEM! Although she's not doing much better in the real world either. Her unconscious body is being molested by a Christmas tree! Freddy corners Ginger and is about to deliver the killing blow, but... Well, maybe you shouldn't have brought your plastic knives then. After that, Jason goes berserk on the party. And what I love is even when this guy manages to set him on fire with little obvious effect, the team still actually try fighting him. <laughs> the main group of teens managed to escape, along with Jason Mewes and McLovin. But instead of going to the cops, they all just want to be dropped off at their houses. And when it's just the two lovebirds alone at Laurie's house, Will finally admits to her why he was in the nuthouse for so long. No, he wasn't a Freddy victim, it was for a different reason. The reason I was sent to Weston is because I saw your dad kill your mom. <laughs> well, that was one of the reasons. The other was he was driven mad by people constantly making fun of good dick. Besides, Laurie's dad doesn't seem like the kind of guy who would do that. He's just concerned for his daughter being around an escaped mental patient. Laurie, listen to me. You're upset. We both are. No, I think what you need now more than anything is to get some rest. <sighs> well, there you go, a perfectly good pair of boxes. Laurie escapes out the window, and his jump scare reunited with Will, and the two head back to meet up with Mark. But, uh-oh. Yep, since he's been off the Hypnosil Dream Suppressant for so long, Freddy can now enter his dreams again. Impaling his feet with some steel wire that hurts him so bad, he literally shits snakes. And after Kruger uses Mark's flesh like one of those novelty toasters, we cut back to the police station where Deputy Scary Movie here wants to call in the FBI to handle the murders. No outsiders, Stubbs. We can handle this. We've stopped him before. Stopped who before? We don't say his name out loud. Voldemort? Well, it's sure clear the police aren't going to be any help. So the deputy instead teams up with the teens, who he managed to find somehow. They decide to head back to the nut house and stock up on Hypnosil, where Jay here decides it's a good time to take a weed break. Because he's an idiot. But then again, the Freddy Caterpillar decides to join him, True, he then crawls down his throat and possesses him right afterwards, but it did seem like a good friendship for a while. So, is Jason here yet? Everyone makes a break for it. All except for the possessed Jay, of course, who manages to stick Voorhees with a gallon of tranquilizers before he's cleft in twain which managed to put him down, so now Freddy, pissed at Jason for stealing all his kills, has Voorhees on his home turf. Not my arm! Why couldn't you take a leg, you inconsiderate bastard? As expected, the fight in the dream world is pretty one-sided, with Freddy tossing Jason around like a rag doll, impaling him, and even dropping a massive boiler onto him. But despite all that, Jason will just not stay down, briefly gaining the upper hand in the fight, which then leads to this. Come on! Come on! Oh, so you are afraid of something after all, huh? What? 
that's... No. Just no. Jason has never at any point in any movie ever shown any signs of being afraid of the water. What is it? That the writers just couldn't figure out a way to put a temporary pause in the fight so they just pulled something out of their ass? Not that it even has any bearing. As in one of the very next shots, it's a flashback of Jason casually walking through the water without any difficulty. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the real world, the teens have Jason tied up in their van and are driving to Crystal Lake, where they plan on pulling Freddy into the real world where the final battle can take place. So as they get nearer, Lori tranks herself out to find him. But she had better hurry. Because if Jason dies too early, they're screwed. Well, not really. I mean, they can always just pull Freddy out and shoot him. But this way, it's a far better spectator spot. Unfortunately for everybody, Jason is the one to wake up first, causing the van to crash and the teens to continue to Crystal Lake on foot. It also turns Freddy's attention to Laurie who he teleports back to 1428 and reveals that actually he was the one who killed her mother. Well, that doesn't affect me. Her dad still owes me a new pair of boxes. Upon arriving at the camp and hiding in one of the cabins, Will tries to wake up the drugged out Lori, who's slowly being slashed to ribbons by Freddy. But then Jason bursts in like the fucking Kool-Aid man, setting the cabin on fire and tearing the teens apart. And while trying to get Laurie away from the flames, Will drops her hand into it, which wakes her up and brings Freddy along with her. Well, the time has finally come. Time to get the title battle underway. Let's move over to our resident fight expert, Hulk Hogan. Hulk, are you there, mate? Well, let me tell you something, Fedora. There's no doubt that Voorhees has the size advantage, brother. He's built like a boulder on legs. But you'd be a damn fool to take your eyes off a of Kruger. He's sneakier than that little bastard, Bobby the Brain Heenan. Oh, he just makes me want to Hulk out so badly, brother. And now, a word from our sponsors. Hi, I'm Hulk Hogan from Hulk Hogan's Beat Shop. Cut him off. Cut him off. Okay, thank you, Hulk. Let's get back to the fight, shall we? Fuck off. Teens can die on their own time. This is fighting time. God damn, this is awesome. Uh, kind of weird how Freddy has suddenly become an expert hand-to-hand -hand fighter between films, though. Uh, but hey, they needed to even this battle out somehow, so who cares? The fight moves over to a construction site where Jason is nailed to the ground and continuously smashed by a physics-breaking wrecking ball thing that never stops moving and it eventually backfires on Freddy and drags him towards Jason where the fight continues close range. Yeah, did I mention that this was fucking awesome? Teleportation! Now Jason's power advantage really starts showing as he pushes Freddy to the end of the docks and is about to deliver the final blow, but... <laughs> oh shit. Now armed with both weapons, Freddy starts mutilating Jason. That is, until the teens, yeah they're still here, light a gas tank on fire and the battle draws to its bloody close with Jason tearing off Freddy's arm while getting his own machete shoved into his heart all the way up to the hilt. Whee! With both killers apparently dead, Laurie and Will embrace when oh shit it's Jason- oh wait no it's Freddy! Shit. So, this is what I've been doing to people? Wow. I'm a monster. Laurie finishes the fight by relieving Freddy of his head, and as the two lovers leave the burnt down camp, this movie comes to an end with a sequel hint. <laughs> and 
And then he went bowling. And that was Freddy vs. Jason. I'll be brutally honest first. Plot-wise, this movie is very unthought out. It was clear the fight was what they had in mind, really, and the story and characters were sort of just the afterthought necessity. But hey, in the end, the fight is what we really wanted to see, and god damn, was it not one of the best and bloodiest battles we ever wanted to see? I for one say, hell yeah! This movie was the most financially successful out of any movie in EVA franchise, and sure it's got a lot of problems, but it does exactly what it set out to do, and it does it damn well. Alright guys, the time has finally come. Time to do the drawing to see who will win the most coveted Nightmare on Elm Street Blu-ray collection, as well as selecting my 51st movie review. So, I have the hat here, let us see whose name gets drawn. And the winner of the giveaway is... Palmer Lee! Congratulations Palmer, you have won yourself the Blu-ray collection, as well as selecting my 51st movie review. But a huge thank you to everyone who has stuck with me for 50 episodes, and hopefully will stick with me for many more. So, I'm Fedora, this is Oh The Horror, save a screen for me, and we'll see you next time.